Tis the gift to be free, tis the gift to come down where you want to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, twill be in the valley of love and delight. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend, we shan't be ashamed. I think conflict transformation is a one is wonderful in theory. I have not seen it work. I have been involved in at least two instances of conflict in our meeting. They were really um, they weren't handled in any way that even looks like a conflict transformation or a conflict resolution. There were many hurt people. Uh, People who had been friends don't even speak anymore. My heart is breaking and my spirit is exhausted <laughs> trying to work uh, through the conflict. I've been involved in trying many, many things and always seeking, seeking ways to find more to address that conflict. I think the reason I'm here is because I'm frightened of conflict. It always makes me feel ill, and that's fear. And I'd like, to, I'd like today to resolve that, somehow for that to be lifted off my spirit. Because it's hard for me to imagine it being resolved or even, trans, even resolved, let alone transformed, when I'm fearful. We're called conflict transformation, the Committee on Conflict Transformation. A lot of people use the term conflict resolution. Um, and so these are the, the two questions um, that are uh, before us as an effort to, to help distinguish between the two. Does someone want to read the first one for us? How do we get this guy to go away so that we can go back to the way we were? That sound familiar? And the second question, would someone else read that one? How can we change the way we operate so that things like this don't happen so often or hurt us so much? And the image that's come to me about this is about, um, with resolution, the meeting's a little train going along its little track, and there's a bumpy part in the track, there's a conflict, and the train gets shunted off to the side, and the conflict gets resolved. There's people are somehow come to an agreement, and the train gets back on its track, and it turns out that that track is a circle, it's a loop, <laughs> right? And you keep coming back to bumpy points and getting shunted off and so on. And with transformation, the train is going along on its track and the bumpy point comes and the, tra the train goes through the bumpy point and, there's, and finds itself off in an unexpected place, a place that maybe it couldn't see before and moving forward through new land. But we haven't found a way to transform mm -hmm. our um, conflicts into a stronger community. So we avoid it. And I don't feel we're a, a united corporate body. It weakens our, at least it weakens my attempt to, to go deeper. I lack the confidence, or I, I feel I lack the support. So if avoiding conflict separates us from God, from our experience of the divine, what could embracing conflict do? I'm suggesting to you that anything in life that matters, such as what we're talking about now, is not a ding, it's fixed process. It's a, I can fix this now, I can't fix this now. It's like being alive. There isn't a key to making sure that it always comes out okay. I urge on you that conflict transformation is conflict transformation. There are things that happen to our meetings that are not susceptible to analysis by conflict transformation. 
And it would be a great disservice to us all if we left here saying, right, you know, the next bad thing that happens, the next time it hits the fan, I'm going to pull out my notes from that conflict transformation <laughs> workshop and everything's going to be okay, because it isn't. All right? A serial uh, sexual offender is frustrated because he can't, he's not being able to do first day school. Somebody who has been writing sermons is frustrated because she's not able to give the sermon during worship as she thinks is appropriate. Recognize the fact that there are some things for which this is not applicable. The correct answer is no. Somebody wants to bring the dog in. The dog barks a lot. No. No. Okay, you want, uh, all right, you, when, when, and unless we're ready to do that, then we really are, do have a problem. I came to find out how to do the conflict trans transformation, and it seems like we are approaching it, and you're saying, now wait, it's not going to work some of the time. That's right. Get used to it. It's not going to work some of the time. And that pisses me off, because I actually <laughs> want it to work. Analyze our meetings with four different considerations. The personal sources of conflict or reactions to it. I become angry, okay? If someone behaves idiotically or if someone tells me I'm not clerking well, or I become defensive and I lash out and I deeply regret it. But there are entire bushel baskets of ways that on a personal level we respond to conflict. There are relational consequences and there are relational sources to conflict within our meetings. By which I mean, how do people actually deal with each other? Are they on you know, committees together? To what extent do those committees uh, reflect collaboration among friends? Or to what extent is the clerk just sort of going forward? Is there a way that the way we deal with each other can get us all closer? This really then implicates the structure of the way we do business. Is there something about the way our meeting operates, the way it organizes itself, that either is an obstacle to collaboration or that feeds silos and individual areas of power? And is there a way that we can enhance changes within the structure of the monthly meeting that would encourage more collaborative behavior? The fourth one of these, okay, was cultural. Are women dominant? Are men dominant? You know, is there a sexist assumption that's going on in the meeting? Are older people deferred to? Is that a good thing? Uh, we've talked about four considerations, personal, relational, structural, and cultural. But it isn't a question of, well, here's personal and here's relation, relational, you know, and so on. It's not four silos that are side by side, okay? There's that consideration, that consideration, that consideration, and that consideration. And right here is the sweet spot. Okay? That's where we live or hope we live. If all we're doing is looking at our navels and saying, gee, I really could be a better person, that, you're not getting the gestalt. You're not getting the exciting, transformational, forward-moving spiritual lift that you could get by being simultaneously aware of all the stuff that's going on in the meeting. The person whose wife died, the person who's having an affair with the other person, the person who resents it that somebody else is putting sprinkles on the kid's ice cream and they always put the sprinkles on the kid's ice cream and nobody even notices that they've been marginalized. That's being conflict sensitive in a way that I hope is helpful to you.
what attracted me to, 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 to Quakerism was that saying about there is that of God in all of us. But the things that we recognize in each other, and conflicts brings this more to, 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 to conscious thought than anything else, you know, is the differences between us. It is the differences between us that is the God in all of us, you know, the differences, the uniqueness in each one of us, you know, that separates us from one another, you know, that, 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 but that's on, on, on a micro level, on the, on the individual is one to one. But if you move up, if you get a, a larger perspective, it's almost like the rainbow, you know, the colors in the rainbow. I don't suppose, you know, the colors in the rainbow, you know, the blue looks at the yellow and say, you yellow, I'm blue. And the green looks, at, you know, says, I'm green, you know. And they may recognize that difference. But as a rainbow, the green, the blue, and all that has a perspective that's melded together and you don't see the individual, the individual colors. You just see, when you say a, a rainbow, you see the broad, broader perspective. <laughs> they may seem separate down here, but on a higher level, they mesh together and they have a particular oneness about them. The ability to see that oneness is, I think, is what we all, all are, are striving for. I feel that it's a richness, actually, in our meeting, that there is a whole spectrum. Um, I mean, I know Elizabeth and I have somewhat different views, but it's just, it, it enriches, it enriches my worship. resolved conflict creatively, deliberately. <laughs> there had not been a deliberate attempt on the part of the meeting which had been successful in resolving conflict creatively, but there was an example of a way in which conflict had been resolved and a step had been taken which had resolved the conflict, but it was not intentional. So, so what I'm hearing you say, if I may, is that there have been instances where the conflict has, where the meeting has moved on and you've ended up in a better place, but not because you intentionally planned to, right. rather because it turned out that way. Am I, is that right? Right. An example of a meeting that was really split by age, that there was a young people who came and were very strong and aggressive uh, as opposed to older Quakers who were frightened of this. And did that cause dissension or a split within yeah. the body? Yeah. So, the, so the dissension was caused by virtue of the status or characteristics of the people themselves, not because of what they did. So, right. am I, is that right? Mm -hmm. Can you tell me more about how that expressed itself? It remains unresolved, and some people have left the meeting. And if I follow you, that there, are, that there are folks who have one understanding of what it's like to be a Quaker and younger folks who have a different understanding of what it's like to be a Quaker and they need to engage each other. Did I hear you right? That's right, but not necessarily younger people. It could be older people too, but they are new to this society. Yeah. And that created a different culture. Now, does someone see what I'm doing? When I, has, have you watched what I've been doing? Mirroring. Mirroring. And what do you, what, what do you, what do you see me do? Uh, you, you respond to clarify and be sure that you've gotten what they're saying. Right. Why, sort of do, I, why do I do that? Showing that you're listening. And also to test. And see if you've got it right. See if I got it right. I call it looping, she calls it mirroring, some people call it spiraling. This is skill number one. What's on your mind? Or tell me a story, or tell me what's in your heart. So, if I heard you right, is that right? Yes. Bingo. If it's yes, what has just happened? I'm suggesting that, that what's happened is 
that the person realizes that they have effectively communicated to somebody who's sympathetic and comprehends what they say. That alone, a lot of people need and don't get. If they say no, there is even a better opportunity to say, I'm, I'm sorry, and they'll explain what it is you misunderstood and you get to do it again right here. Now we come to what's called looping. Because in addition to saying, is that right? Yes. You say, why? And they, and they tell you more. And you say, oh, so you, yes. Why? And they tell you more. And it goes again and again and again and again. And it spirals and becomes richer more robust, more spiritually full. Now I think that this technique, if you want to call it that, this is something that's taught, is actually deeply embedded in our Quaker traditions. There is something of God in that person. And what you're saying by looping is, I'm prepared for you to expose me to that. Would you please show me that? It reaffirms that person's humanity. It reaffirms that person's spiritual center. And it reaffirms our faith that every person, every person is what? Worth listening to? You don't have to agree. You may, in the back of your mind, say, you know, I have a reservation about this. This person could be a little nuts. That's all fine. That's all fine. But right now, you're not drawing conclusions. What you're doing is looping. Try me again. Tell me. Teach me. Teach me. My understanding of our traditions in meeting for worship, whether for business or, or otherwise, is that it does not contemplate dialogue like this. This is what I think happens in business meeting, all right? In a beautifully, elegantly clerked business meeting, we are in a state of worship. Someone says, this is a square. No one argues about that. No one says, you idiot. Someone then is moved to say, I see a rectangle. The clerk hears square, the clerk hears rectangle, the meeting is, abides. And someone says, it's a triangle. They don't say, no, you're wrong, it's a triangle. They say, that portion of the light that they hold. And then the clerk or someone else has this lovely moment and says, Friends, we're looking at a wedge of cheese. And everyone says, approved. <laughs> right? Now that looks like conflict, doesn't it? And what it is, is inconsistent truths, or truths that look inconsistent, right? And that each mouse is tempted to say the other two are wrong. So in worship, in, in, in moments of spiritual discernment, I think we're talking a different game. If you hear the difference between um, why do you want us to only serve vegan meals at potluck and what's important to you about only offering vegan meals at potluck? Do you hear a difference? That the why can keep a person in a defense, feel defensive and defensive is closed. And what's important to you is inviting um, them to connect with their values um, rather than be in a, an argumentative sort of, you know, here's my case, ABC. Um, so I just would offer that as, as an alternative of what's important to you about it. It's an invitation to, to open our heart, which is where we want to be. It occurred to me that the, uh, the more we struggle with our personalities and our, and our ways, ways of life, we have to realize that the, 
the communion, communion is not just among us, it's also a communion with the Spirit. And if we are struggling to communicate with each other, then the spirits that want to communicate with us are having a tough time too. So it's a two-way street. We need the spirit and the spirit needs us. Members and attenders fear doing anything um, because it will ruffle feathers or something. So I'm here because uh, the classic Quakerly uh, problem of should we discuss it and think about it and try to come to s consensus and take 15 years doing so, or should we actually get something done? And I think that that um, difference in personality sometimes creates a lot of conflict in our meeting. The meeting has had conflict after conflict after conflict, and each one of them has seemed like this huge crisis. And it seemed as if, you know, if only we could resolve this, maybe we could settle down. But no, there was another crisis after that and another crisis after that. And people come to us and say, you know, we have this problem, fix it, you know. And we kind of wring our hands and say, we don't know how to fix it. What, you know, what are we supposed to do? So, and there have been a lot of less than helpful responses to pro conflict, including some of mine. Um, so I, I want to, <laughs> I want to be able to help, and I want to be able to do it right. I am afraid of conflict. I think a lot of Quakers are, and we don't deal with it well, and I don't think it's getting the guy to go away as much as we're afraid this guy is going to go away and that we bend over backwards we have to be nice and engulf this person in spending hours with this and and not really solving anything is there an over concern of not hurting people's feelings you know i mean as opposed to being just like you know this is how it is here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is a certain value in, you know, bluntness. I understand you're not purposely trying to hurt someone, but... Meetings tend to work hard at not offending or hurting feelings. We turn and we do offend and hurt the feelings of others but very badly and maybe more so than we would have if we had said to the person, you know, that is not our process. That is not the way we do things here. We have a certain structure. We have a certain way. There is a way of looking at dispositions with respect to conflict. That when you understand it, you might know yourself better. And you might recognize in other people certain behaviors. Along this axis, we're going to talk about people being assertive. These are people, in other words, who are rather meek or, or not prepared to go ahead and... And these are people who are quite the opposite. And this measures cooperativeness, all right? Someone who is highly assertive and yet not very cooperative. Not that I know anyone in my life like that, but... That person is uh, what, stubborn or insistent or competitive or uh, uh, my way of the highway, you know, right? So we'll call this person competitive. Someone who is highly assertive and highly cooperative is a, collabora a collaborationist. Someone who is not assertive and not cooperative is, is, is this person, right? No, I, you know, avoidance, uh, denial, um, you know, not going to make a big deal out of this. He's an avoider. 
someone who is highly cooperative but has no strong assertive qualities will be uh, will accommodate whatever you say is fine if you're upset about something fine we'll do it your way you know I'm not going what okay so this person is uh, an accommodator then we have the great magical ground which is let's take half of you and half of you now you're equally dissatisfied and that's going to be the outcome right the person who compromises so this is a compromiser so what you're going to do is place yourself on this grid in response to the prompts I'm going to give you, okay? <laughs> so the first thing is I want you to place yourself on the grid uh, based on how you as an individual respond to re uh, conflict in your family of origin. <laughs> how you respond when there's a conflict at Thanksgiving, not that that ever happens, so go ahead and move to where you feel, you can think of a specific event. There's no right or wrong here. Yeah, interesting distribution. Yeah. Okay. How do you respond to conflict in an intimate relationship? Whether it's a marriage, your best friend from forever, maybe that's the same person. How do you respond to conflict in an intimate relationship. <laughs> Is this one that people want edited out? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Now, how you respond to conflict at a place of work. Could be former work, <laughs> could be present work. Okay, so more assertive up there. Mm -hmm. Conflict. <laughs> so then um, the last one is how you respond to conflict in your monthly meeting. How you respond to conflict in your monthly meeting. When you experience or witness conflict, where do you go? So you've been, res you've been moving around and thinking about where you are on this grid as an individual. And now the invitation is to take a bird's eye view and place yourself where you ex experience, where you perceive your meeting respond to conflict. How do you see your meeting respond to conflict? How do you experience that? Yeah. So what's freshest here is how you understand, how you experience, observe your meeting's response to conflict. When we were talking in our small groups about <clears throat> communication and that kind of thing, somebody used the word about a stuck. And that's what it is in our meeting. Mm -hmm. People are stuck mm -hmm. and not, and not move. moving and can't move. Some people seem to like conflict, thriving on conflict, mm -hmm. and other people are very reticent, so that causes <laughs> more conflict. What is the mindset that results in we're not going to deal with this right now? You know, I, I really think it is that people go into this protective um, attitude of we can't open up that can of worms because there's not enough time and not enough energy. So often there's the, the presenting problem, the presenting need, um, and then there's the, the deeper one, 
And then there's the transforming one. The iceberg that we see, you know, what's above the surface. You know, it's the color of the rug. It's, um, you know, how, uh, just what seemed like incredibly um, mundane things that carry underneath them this huge weight of, um, of unmet met needs. I think by a need, what I recognize it as is people need to be accepted. They need to be respected. They need to be loved. They need to be safe. They need to feel that they're part of the tribe. <laughs> These are, there aren't a lot of them, but they're absolutely basic. The lower part of the iceberg is always there and will always be mostly mysterious. And it's wonderful that we constantly have new things to learn and explore. Yeah, I think that puts for me a whole different look on this because when I look at people in our meeting I, and, you know, stuck, all of us stuck in our things. And I say, oh, everybody's so needy in my head. I say, everybody's so needy. They want this and they want that. But to put it in the positive sense that you did about, well, everybody needs the same thing rather than have it be negative, needy, you know, mm -hmm. like this, mm -hmm. but, but needy that everybody has it. Um, that, that really is, is useful for me to think of it that way. Conflict, prayer, and spiritual healing. One way that helps open us to divine love is to pray for that person I am having difficulty with every time he or she comes to thought, trailing wisps of resentment. God, give what he needs to become whole and healed, filled with your grace and joy. My experience has sometimes been that all I can say through gritted teeth, if necessary, is God, give her what she needs. If despite my discomfort with this person, I am able to pray steadfastly for him or her, eventually my teeth become unclenched, my jaw loosens. I can start where I am and pray as best I can. Sometimes this prayer fills me unexpectedly with love. Connie McPeak Green and Marty Paxson Grundy. Matthew 18, Wisdom for Living in Community. Pendle Hill Pamphlet, 399. You pray for somebody with whom you have a resentment for two weeks. And the prayer is that you wish them all that they need and all that they desire. And at the end of the two weeks, it is I who have been changed. I do think it's important to go back to what's on the screen, okay? Because what Heather asked was two questions. What's this person need, right? And then, is that my job? The meeting is not the elixir of love, you know what I mean? The meeting is not the thing that suddenly satisfies every sentient being. It's, it's a religious community. It's not a social service. It's not a social service organization. It's not a school. It's not a family. It's not a spouse. And sometimes people have needs that the meeting is not well fit to address. And guess what happens then? I love you, but no, I guess is what happens then, right? It's a, it's a double stage question that Heather asked. What does this person need that they're not getting? And then, what's the meeting's responsibility in answering that need? And they have distinct, and I hope palliative, answers. Don't assume that the meeting is there to make sure that every person is happy. In this, this role play, 
Larry is Sal. And Sal has regu regularly volunteered for activities like crop walk, service at the local food bank, Habitat for Humanity, and similar programs. Last Thanksgiving, Sal brought two guests to the meeting's potluck dinner. Since then, Sal has regularly brought one or two guests to each potluck lunch. On one or two recent occasions, Sal has, only taken, has also taken up a collection for the guests. When the proceeds of one such collection did not meet Sal's expectations, he became angry and was not seen for several weeks. The meeting began receiving calls from people seeking aid, and a number of guests began to arrive on their own each week asking about the meal program. Several weeks later, Sal returned and spoke at length about the betrayal he had felt at the meeting's hands and the lack of support given to the ministry he was so clearly called to lead. Ministry and Council has asked you to speak to Sal. Hi, Sal. How are you doing? I'm Stephen. How's it going, Stephen? All right. Okay. All right. Um, it's great to see you back. Oh, I went through some changes, but I, I'm back. I'm back with a message, though. That, what's, what's the message? And what were the changes? As quick as we, uh, we extend ourselves to those who are in need and to the helpless and the homeless, you know, uh, I think that we need to pay more attention to that. I think that a lot of people value the, um, the, the, the ministry that you're doing, and a lot of people in the meeting value that. Perhaps what should be done, we need to set up a structure within the meeting itself to deal with these kinds of questions, you know. We need to have a structure where we can offer those kinds of services and prepare to, to carry them through on the show. So I think um, I would love it if, if maybe you could, could you write something down? Beautiful <laughs> idea, that, now that's collaboration. Thank you so much. All right, thanks so much. What did you see, what did people see Steve doing? Welcoming. How was he being affirming and welcoming? Saying thank you for bringing the concern, mm -hmm. for bringing, feeling comfortable to bring people. Glad he was back. Mm -hmm. But I thought he was really energetic, welcoming. Your whole demeanor was nice. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, mostly you were listened to. You, you really listened till you understood more and more about his mission. Say before I say anything or respond, I want to be sure that I understand you and then you go through that process and then, then at the end you can say, I think I, you know, now that we've gone through this, I understand fairly well what you're presenting and I have to tell you that I, I it's my understanding that there's some barriers to this in the meeting and then you can express what you were sent to express and then try to go forward. Part of our tradition here is that when someone does have a leaning, mm -hmm. we encourage them to engage with the community. I'm so glad that you're informing me that there is a process for this mm -hmm. and that I should have followed the process and I will. I appreciate your well, sticking your neck out. You took a risk, didn't you? It's sure. not easy to move us. We are pretty solid. <laughs> and you, you, you hit us. So thank you. It's thank really, you. Thank you very much. It's really wonderful that you've done that. What was your experience? Well, I, I was fearful. I didn't want to, I felt a sense of, I felt a sense of responsibility. What was at stake for you? What was the risk? I don't guess I had really appreciated when I joined, when I agreed to serve on MNC, just how, um, well, weighty, to use that word, um, a responsibility it is. Mm -hmm. If I'm really thinking of this man's spiritual center mm -hmm. 
and my own and that of ours, that's a pretty heavy thing. It's, it feels like a burden in the moment, and I'm frightened that I will not, not be able to hold it. I guess that's what it is, right. that I'll so vomit. You're, you're very aware of the tenderness. That's, that's a good way of putting it. That's a, mm -hmm. that's a kind and gracious way of putting it. I fear the inner critic in me is being too severe. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can lighten up about it, but mm -hmm. yeah. When a person expresses disappointment or anger, when he's putting forth that the community is not living up to what the expectations of the community is, you know, it puts a burden on the person who's going to come to you, come to me, yeah. and question me about that. You know what I mean? It's like uh, you're the one that's being held at fault because you represent as ministry and council, you represent sure. the community itself. Right. So you've got to take the brunt <laughs> of my that's angle right. or what? Right. And that's not an easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. It's not, yeah, sure. So some of, some of what I'm hearing here is about our expectations of each other and, and of the meeting, right? And are we able to, to hold each other as whole and resourceful people, right? Is that, is that something that we're, that's possible? And what shifts when we do that instead of, um, you know, I need to protect and, and defend and be very, very careful and delicate. What shifts when you say, you know, you're whole and resourceful. And here's, you know, here's the way, here's the way it is here. What shifts? And, and have people heard in their meeting the, the term unquakerly? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's unquakerly, unquakerly. to oh, be yeah. angry? Yes. You know, I think that that's, that that's part of it, that there's this you know, sense of identity. If, oh, if I'm angry, I'm, I'm a bad Quaker. I don't get my Quaker badge. We can agree on the peace testimony, uh, on you know, what to do about Syria. Um, but that's something abstract from uh, a firm uh, spiritual uh, depth about my interaction with you on a peaceful, level and in a way that builds um, builds a peaceful community. Listen for interests and needs and listen for opportunities for faith. What role does faith have? We're going to continue with Sam. I began to really question whether this community is really what it's about at all. I don't know what ministry and council can do to help resolve that feeling inside of me. What do you think? I think some of us would like to meet with you now and maybe a few times more to explore with you your, your discontent. I'm, I'm rather reluctant, uh, Charlotte. I don't really believe that much is going to come beyond mere words. I don't think they got the help that, that this, 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 this meeting is, is capable of. I don't believe that. Are you aware of the process that should happen when anyone has an individual leading? Has anyone spoken to you about that? In that respect, I, I admit fault on my part. I'll be truthful with you again. I think it would be a waste of my time. I'm not prepared to do that. Well, I'm prepared to go on listening to you and maybe bringing one or two other people to hear what you have to say as well. Then we can part amicably. <laughs> <laughs> Did anyone else feel incredibly uncomfortable during that? I did. Mm -hmm. oh. But you know one thing, that, that uncomfortableness that, that we feel is real. What I'm trying to bring to you is there are going to be times when they're not resolvable. Mm -hmm. I mean, all conflicts are not going to be resolved. Well, we say transformation because it's a moving on. 
If there's no reconciliation between the person and, and, and the person, now, it's best that they leave. It's best that they leave. When I say best that they leave, it's the best for both of them. Because otherwise, otherwise it'd be conflict ongoing. <laughs> ongoing conflict. It seems to me that what Sal is asking for is recognition, if you will, of his leading and also recognition of the importance of the people whom he was bringing who he felt didn't receive what they needed. Now that's what I'm perceiving as Sal's, or at least some of Sal's needs. Right. What's the, the second meeting, question though, at the The meeting is not able to meet that need. There you go. But, but, in the discussion with Sal, if I can be affirming enough of the genuineness of what Sal is bringing and what Sal's needs are, I may be able to play a transformative role, even though Sal will still leave at the end, because honestly and truly, the meeting cannot meet that need. That's right. well, so know. in that case, there has been a transformation, and I think it's a positive transformation, and it may even lead the meeting to reevaluate what it can or cannot do. Don't feel frustrated that you are a failure, that you've done something wrong, or there's something wrong with that. You, know, you, got, you have to move beyond that. That's where the transformation comes in. The transformative part is that, well, you know, we tried, we, we offered everything, we tried to meet his needs, and we could not meet his needs at this time. You know, but the door is open. Conflicts that arise in this yearly meeting to which the Conflict Transformation Committee's attention is brought, almost always deal with money, property, building, expansion, or in certain ways, pe people's responses to them. Almost always implicate a failure of ministry and council. Within ministry and council, we have a bunch of people. We are people who are not qualified to be social workers, to be counselors, to be you know doctors, lawyers, whatever, to the to the meeting. Nobody really knows what the heck to do. So maybe they we sit back a little bit and don't do anything. So when conflict presents itself, offers itself, what is the meeting's responsibility? A tepid or an effective ministry and council is an invitation to dysfunction. It says here, page 118. I'm getting old. <laughs> ministry and council, A, purpose. The meeting on ministry and council has particular responsibility for the nurture of the religious life of the meeting. Its purposes are to exercise general care of the meetings for worship and support of spiritual ministry and to provide pastoral care of the membership. Ministry and council's charge is to care for the spiritual nurture of the meeting. And if the meeting has an unpleasant, unfortunate, regrettable, ugly, hurtful, nasty problem, ministry and council had better address that and engage in it. And their failure to do so, all right, I'm suggesting to you is the real source of the problem. Eldering, page 144 in the glossary. Gently admonishing in love the ways, habits, or thoughts of a friend or a tender. 
after serious consideration by or consultation with the respected members of the meeting. In the absence of loving care, why do you think the guy is bringing the dog in? Why do you think she's writing all her sermons? What, is she supposed to be born with an understanding of our spiritual traditions? It's, 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 the, it's the dual failure, all right, of ministry and counsel as a body and of eldering as an active tradition, an active and loving and supportive tradition so that friends are made aware of and grow in and supported in our faith. You don't do that as a, as a meeting, as a meeting, not as an individual, as a meeting with, with broad consultation with other respected friends. If you, don't, if you don't love and care for that individual, what you're asking for it, aren't you? The body is the object of our concern. I urge us not to be deflected by compassion, by sympathy, by feelings of social urgency, by love. In the manner in which we are met today, our concern is the spiritual health of our meetings. It's the body. I think it's critical when we leave here that we leave with a clear sense that the skills, the insights, the rubric, the analysis, the vocabulary we've been in is in service of the monthly meeting. It is true that we do not live and will not live in the peaceable kingdom. I grant that. Let's also remember that it is not a comfortable thing. It isn't fun to be in. It isn't fun to watch. It's not fun to facilitate. It's not enjoyable to watch people's hearts get broken. It's not enjoyable, okay, to be perceived as someone who hurts other people. So let's embrace that. Let's say, okay, what we're talking about is an uncomfortable, regrettable, unavoidable, not progressive, not fatal, not incurable event. Seen through this prism, it is Finally, the tip of an iceberg is floating down. Finally, now we have the opportunity to actually address this thing we didn't know about. Finally, okay, we have a tangible moment, a presenting problem. Our response to that problem is, thank you, God, for this blessing. Thank you, God, for this blessing that now our meeting has the necessity to do your work and to grow through this. Conflict invites us to change. It invites us to get a step closer to what God wills for us as a meeting. It's an opportunity to engage in work that God is asking us to do. So I hope that despite its discomfort, despite all of the negative attributes of it, you have the spiritual courage and the confidence and the joy to enter into God's work.
powerful transformation was the, um, the idea of conflict transforming into something else, to non-conflict. I have finally understood that it's not making conflict into non-conflict, it's transforming how I see things, how I view the conflict and, and the changes that occur within me.